and welcome back to Voice Talks. I'm Sofia Altuna from our Google Assistant team and your host for this monthly live stream about all things voice. Today, we're discussing how voice technology is shaping gaming and education and how the two interconnect more than we think. Since we launched the Assistant four years ago, games have always been a popular use case. It is not surprising that this has only increased over the past years especially now since more people are spending time at home and looking for fun activities to do within their walls. The tools to build games have also improved significantly. At first, smart speakers didn't even have a screen, but we quickly learned that conversations are just much richer with visuals. And in fact, about 50% of people use both voice and visual inputs in a single session. So with the launch of smart displays, which are essentially just the speakers with the screens, we also created capabilities that allow developers to build great immersive gaming experiences. While we're seeing more and more games being built for voice assistants, we're also seeing how gaming companies are building voice into their video games, making the games feel a whole lot more real, allowing gamers to do things like control and navigate the game via voice and to talk to other players in real time. So voice communication is quickly becoming a core part of the gaming experience. And today, we're going to hear directly from a few developers who've been building voice games using these tools. Over the past year, we've also been seeing an increased interest in educational experiences. Technology is already playing a huge role in and outside of the classroom, and it will just continue to be essential for enhancing education for students of all ages. It helps that students are also increasingly familiar with this technology, in the US, for example, about 90% of 4 to 11 year olds have access to a voice assistant, according to an eMarketer article. And the trends are actually pretty similar for students of all different ages. So in many cases, this technology is not something entirely new that they have to learn. And this could enhance learning and boost engagement in many different ways. For example, voice assistants just have so much information that they can really help provide real-world understanding of topics. They can also help students practice math, learn how to spell, or even learn a new language. And it can also be very helpful for students with special needs who have difficulty using a keyboard or just communicating with the class. However, voice technology is not only useful for students, but also for teachers and for larger educational institutions. I was reading a lot of the articles that a lot of the comments that you submitted and teachers were saying how voice has been helping them manage the physical and the digital classroom. Everything from simple things such as setting up timers and routines to more complex things such as setting up the weekly spelling list or even conducting oral exams remotely. I've also noticed an increased adoption in schools and universities. Many universities globally, like for example, Northeastern University in Boston and Lancaster University in the UK, now have their own voice personas. Students can access it on their phone or on their smart displays to get information about campus life, classes, or just other school resources. So I just went over a few examples, but there's really so many more, and I've actually been learning a lot of, from the comments that you've all been submitting. And this really opens up a whole new way of learning. And I think that we're just getting started with voice education in technology. With that, we have a very special guest to kick things off and to share more about current trends and user insights. It's my pleasure to welcome back to Voice Talks, VoiceBuzz.ai CEO, Brett Kinsella. Well, thank you, Sophia. Yes, I am Brett Kinsella from VoiceBot.ai. Really excited to be here again in episode three. I was here in episode one, took a hiatus for episode two, but back and I've got some more data to share with you. And in fact, it's new data. And really what we want to focus on today is smart speaker use, use of voice assistance in the home, the predominant way we're using voice in the home, in the post-COVID pandemic environment. And it has had some big impacts. So you can check me out at Brett Kinsella at voicebot.ai. I'll try to tweet if you have questions, those types of things. Uh, and the other thing that I was going to point out is a lot of this data is available at research.voicebot.ai. Some of it will be coming in forthcoming reports. But if you just keep track of research.voicebot.ai, there's lots of things you can download, including some of this data. Okay. So what I really want to focus on here is the idea of frequency of use cases. And I've got five charts to share with you today. 
So the first is that COVID and the stay-at-home policies in particular have really been a catalyst for more smart speaker use. What you see is about three in five smart speaker owners say they're using smart speakers more since they've had these stay-at-home policies in place. And about a third are, are using about the same. So almost nobody's using it. A very small percent is using it less. The next thing I want to bring up is the biggest increase in use is daily active users. So if you look at that, that rose about 10% from 49, almost 50% to just 59%. And what you see is a slight fall in the monthly active users. Those went into the daily active users and a much bigger fall in the people who didn't use it very often. So there's this idea of proximity to smart speakers. You're around them more each day because you're not at work or you're not at the kids' games on the weekends and those types of things is leading people to actually access the devices more frequently. So the next thing I thought I would point out is looking at the top five movers. So we've tracked 18 use cases for the last several years now on smart speakers and looked at if people have ever tried them, monthly active users, daily active users. And here I want to focus just on monthly active users. These are the five groups that between January of this year and June of this year, so with the COVID pandemic in between, these are the top five that changed in terms of their uh, monthly active user base. And as you can see, there's a couple here that are interesting. So we've got this idea of connecting with people. So sending a message and calling someone, you know, both ro rose about 40 to 43%. Uh, the next thing I think about this idea of sort of planning, planning your day and access my calendar jumped almost 40%. That's 40 nominal percentage points over, over the past. And part of that, I think is that most, most, People would go to work normally and then they would check their calendar. They check their calendar in the car, you know, before they start driving or when they get to the office. Well, now people are at home all day. So they're more likely to start using the calendar function on their smart speakers when they get up and they have it you know, easily accessible to them. So they've got that smart speaker there for that planning activity. Another is traffic and directions. I was really surprised this one moved up so quickly because not many people are out uh, driving around, but maybe it's higher because a lot of people aren't taking public transportation. If they do go out, they might be looking for directions to new places to, to get food, farmer's markets maybe. I don't know, but that was one of the big movers. And then the last one probably wouldn't surprise you. More people are cooking at home, restaurants were closed, and they were looking for new recipes. And we've seen this with other data. Meredith Corp and their all recipe skill had, had talked about this earlier this year, but obviously a really big mover. People are, are, are using recipes more often. And in fact, this was really big for daily active user jump, almost 5x. Okay, so let's look at a couple of those uh, changes in daily active users. So the first thing I want to look at is, uh, is asking a general question. So first of all, I'll tell you, when we look at these 18 use cases, they all pretty much stayed in the same order. A couple of them moved around a couple of places, but for the most part, one through 18, in terms of the frequency of use was about the same. Streaming music service, number one, number two, questions. Now for, for questions, really interesting, about a 50% rise. So think about this, you're around the smart speakers more frequently each day, and, and then you're there because you can ask questions. So you're gonna ask more questions because you're around it. I think that's pretty straightforward, but a 50% rise in the monthly active users reported uh, around asking questions. Another thing I wanted to pull out and talk to you about, which I think is really good news for third parties, is we had a doubling of people who are using third-party voice apps. So Google Actions, Alexa Skills, doubling of them uh, after COVID. So as COVID came a lot, people were around more. And what we interpret from the data is that because people were around them more, because there wasn't other programming, there weren't other things to do necessarily, and the proximity, they started to explore more and they started to try more things, not just the first party, the native capabilities of the assistant, but also looking for what else that they could provide them for or provide them with during the day. And one of those might be things like recipes, which is not a first party. That's a, those tend to be third party uh, solutions and, and some of the you know, other types of things. And the other really big one that we can look at is games. So games actually tripled. So when we think of whether it's trivia or another type of voice acted game, if we look at January versus June, 3X. And so as people are around them more, they're exploring, they're trying some things out. And these are daily active users of games. This is a really significant rise. Now, every, every one of these went up 
in each of the categories in terms of ever tried, monthly active, and daily active. But I wanted to point out a couple of these and sort of this, the games, recipes, uh, asking questions in that third party are really, I think, helpful to understand. And then finally, I thought I would just close with a summary. So the COVID impact on smart speaker use is pretty simple. Smart speakers have really solidified their place in daily life. And so we see them being used more frequently by more people. Uh, the order of the use case frequency didn't change. So people are still using things relatively the same amount. So they're still using things like media, listening to radio, streaming music a lot. They're doing things like product search and product purchase less, but, but all of them, they're using them more than they were pre-COVID. And great news for third-party developers. Consumers seem to be discovering more of them and using them with higher levels of frequency. So I'm Brett Kinsella from voicebot.ai. That's a quick snapshot on how COVID and pandemic may have changed the way people view and certainly use their smart speakers on a regular basis. And I look forward to being back for a future episode of Voice Talks with more data to share with you. Back to you, Sophia. Thank you, Brett. It's always such a pleasure to have you. Anyone in the voice space knows the value of the research reports from voicebot.ai, and we're thrilled to have Brett join us on future episodes to share more relevant insights and trends. As a member of the Google Partnerships team, it's really great to see the growth in third-party actions. I'm constantly so impressed with the creativity of many of the actions being created. I also think that seeing a rise in games was definitely expected, not only are more people home, passing the time and playing games, but also there continues to be more and more really great games on voice assistants. And before we dive further into this episode and I share some more of my own personal experiences, I know today we have a lot of game developers, teachers, and viewers that use voice assistants a lot at their homes. So I wanna know, is there a voice game or learning tool you like to experience as a family? And you know the drill, you can answer this in the comment section below or by using the hashtag AskSophia on Twitter, and we will be sharing some of your answers later on. This is super relevant because a lot of people tuning in today are looking to either be inspired in new ways that they can use their devices or to look for new ideas that they can build. And today there's also going to be a lot of developers hearing about the experiences that you're creating and they're interested in learning a lot about what you like and what you're using the most. So to start us off, we're gonna have a fireside chat with Marco Lenocci, who leads our gaming partnerships effort on Assistant, with Paul Joffe from Sony and Ian Freed from Bamboo Learning to discuss their voice applications. For our product talk segment, we have Leon Nichols, a Google developer relations engineer, giving a deep dive into Canvas and Action Builder that were just announced at Voice Global last week. And then Mary Chen will interview Terry Jensen from Cool Games for our partner Spotlight. And to wrap up the show in our ecosystem update, we're gonna have Catherine Prescott talking through how she discovers and features new voice actions to share with the voice community. All right, so we have lots of content and speakers in this next 45 minutes, so let's get right into it. Last week at Voice Global, our Senior Director of Product Management, Payam Shodai, touched on the challenges of schools being closed and highlighted some of our partners' efforts in bringing great educational experiences into the home. So I'm excited to introduce my colleague, Marco, who will be interviewing Ian from Bamboo Learning and Paul from Sony, discussing their voice applications and what's next on their roadmap. Take it away, Marco. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today at Voice Talks. We launched Assistant in 2016 with the goal to get things done more naturally and delight users with magical experiences. I'm lucky to have been part of the journey for over half of the time, leading our ecosystem partnership efforts. Having worked on the smart display since the first Nerd Stabs came out, I'm particularly excited about the tremendous growth in devices adoption. According to a study of VoiceBot.ai, at the beginning of 2020, over one third of US adults had a smart display speaker in their home and about 50% say that they are using the devices daily. That translates into nearly 90 million US adults with devices, 45 million active users, and over 70 million monthly active users. And we all know that this is just the beginning. So smart display inside the home will play a bigger role in our daily lives to stay connected, learn, and be entertained. A big part of my role 
now is to lead partnership strategy around a few core investment areas where we believe voice and assistant is going to be the best way to interact. Playing fun family games, learning and educating ourselves, and amazing storytelling experiences. Smart Display provides an incredible opportunity to make voice experiences even more compelling through the addition of immersive visuals powered by our interactive Canvas API and Actions Builder, which you will hear more about from my colleagues in the next segment. What we observed over the past year is that there is a growing interest from our users in games, stories and education experiences. We have been working closely with voice first startups, pure game developers and brands to push the boundaries of what our platform can do. I'm really amazed to see the innovation in this space and the delightful experiences that we are seeing coming to the assistant. Today, I want to highlight two amazing partners who have built new interactive experiences in games and education. Paul Joffe, head of Games Book Publishing at Sony Pictures Entertainment. Hello, Paul. Hello, very happy to be here. And Ian Fried, CEO of Bamboo Learning. Thanks so much, Marco. It's great to be here. Let's start with Paul. A brand that we've all grown to love, Sony Pictures Entertainment, brought the classic TV trivia shows like Jeopardy and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire to Assistant, and now are available as experiences on, on our smart displays. Paul is the one that helped us lead these initiatives, bringing these delightful games to the assistant. We all know and love the successful TV footprints that these games have, along with their large fan bases. So, Paul, would you like to introduce yourself and speak more about what attracted you to the voice ecosystem and how it contributes to your digital strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as you've heard, I, I run a games group at Sony Pictures um, within the studio. And really what our remit has been is to look at places where Sony can invest, develop, um, own uh, certain game experiences rather than license out. We uh, do a lot on mobile, uh, but we also look at a lot of emerging platforms and voice became one of those that uh, really excited us. We started very early years ago when, when the new voice tech started to emerge. And I think for us, it was a, uh, a great place to look at our game show IP, like you said, who wants to be a millionaire in Jeopardy? Because you know, for years, people have been on the couch, shouting out at the TV, trying to interact with, uh, with those shows. And you know, games over that time have been a little bit more limited in what they could do. Uh, Jeopardy, for example, is a, a show where you're doing free form answers, but we always would have to give multiple choice if we were going to create a game on it. So voice came along and we immediately found that you could do a far more authentic and natural type of experience with these types of shows. And it was super exciting. Uh, we immediately found uh, a lot of... Uh, people and fans and audiences immediately attached to it. Um, you know, the show was incredibly excited about it. And so that has been, you know, since then, we've just launched into continuing to develop those experiences and looking at other ways that we can bring our IP and voice together. Thank you, Paul. Um, and I'm one of the people that have been playing this game since I was very young. Uh, these are really perfect examples of truly magical voice experiences. I remember growing up in Italy, like I've enjoyed playing Who Wants to Be a Millionaire at home with family and friends. I remember like staring at the TV, thinking that if I only had the chance to participate, I could probably win the game. And I was like, yeah, don't we all think the same, right? So, so honestly, like knowing that I can play the game on assistant without millions of people watching, it makes me feel much, much better. Uh, now, Ian, at Bamboo Learning, uh, your mission is to create conversation based approaches to high quality learning for all. And by all accounts, Bamboo Learning seems to have really excelled at that mission with two Webby Awards for Educational Learning and winning Educational Voice Developer and Educational Voice Experience Awards for 2020 at, Voice, at Project Voice. So it's clear that Bamboo Learning have embraced voice as an integral part of learning. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and your role at Bamboo Learning and share more with the viewers about how the company is leaning to conversation-based learning? Uh, absolutely. Thanks so much for that uh, introduction, Marco. Uh, I've had uh, a 30-year career in digital content and digital device technology and business. 
and uh, actually spent uh, 12 years as a VP at Amazon, uh, including leading the Amazon Kindle business, as well as the Amazon Alexa and Echo businesses. So I do have a, uh, a strong background in understanding uh, the voice experience and conversational learning. I co-founded Bamboo Learning uh, in 2018, really with the goal to create highly interactive, uh, both voice and visual experiences on these conversational platforms like Google Assistant. And uh, we, we really uh, envision uh, voice platforms being unique uh, with our product uh, in three key ways. Uh, first, uh, conversational experiences uh, like Bamboo Luminaries uh, are really done in a way that you don't have to be tied to a keyboard or a screen. Uh, you can be um, in the living room just talking and interacting uh, and glance at the screen if you do have uh, a Nest Hub device, for example. Um, second, uh, and this one's also important, is that we do see these devices uh, in family areas. So, for example, you might have them in the kitchen, you might have them in the living room, so the entire family can interact uh, with this learning experience. And then third, uh, also really important for a learning application, there's no installation and there's no configuration. So if you'd like to start, for example, our Bamboo Luminaries uh, experience, you just say, hey, Google, talk to Bamboo Luminaries, and it's really easy. That's wonderful. Uh, I really love educational experiences that keep families together and engage in a casual, like fun way. Um, and as you said, like being integrated in the environment, uh, bamboo learning actions are really suitable to enable learning moments in the households be in between other activities, if you will. Um, so Paul, um, I know that uh, Sony Pictures have, has made several key bets in the voice space. Uh, looking ahead to the next year, what are you excited to see happening in the voice ecosystem and with Google Assistant in particular? Uh, yeah, uh, so... You know, we have continued to build out our team and continue to look at uh, what what we can do. I think one of the key things and parts of our success has we've made um, voice games operational the way that they are in mobile, so that we're constantly delivering new content, we're constantly updating and refining and using analytics to improve what we're doing. I think in the coming year, uh, there's probably about three areas that we're really focused in on. Um, one is a lot more visual devices are coming out that are integrating voice, not only standalones, but it's getting integrated into televisions and, and other uh, devices uh, all throughout the, uh, the home. Um, so looking at how we can support the voice with those, um, those added displays and, and make those sparkle and, and add a little bit more flair to the, to the interaction uh, is something we're excited about and we've been talking to um, you, Marco, and your team about um, on the Google Assistant side. Uh, monetization's really critical. You know, we uh, want this to become a sustainable marketplace. We want to be able to invest more. We want to be able to, uh, to bring in more content. And so finding a way to obviously uh, make money off of it uh, and and support that is is really is really critical. Uh, you know, we've really tried to to be at the the advent of that, looking at different models. And I know we're a little bit guinea pigs on the on the Google Assistant team side, trying to kind of figure out some of those flows and and make those work. And we're happy to 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 do that and uh, to um, to be there to to make that happen because it's so critical. Uh, if we're able to support the teams and, and the further development and, and bring premium content uh, to the platform. I think the, the other big area we're looking at is social. Uh, Ian was talking about you know, how the devices are all over the house and, um, and you know, how, how do you use them to bring people together, uh, whether it's for learning or for entertainment or for play in, in our case. And you know, we've already seen some great uh, reactions. Uh, Jeopardy, which really doesn't have a multiplayer uh, experience right now, people are already offline sharing, comparing, both in households and we know across the country with, with friends and relatives. So we really want to start to think about how do we 
um, integrate things into the uh, into the action that will uh, that will enhance that. Uh, on who wants to be a millionaire, we have a system where people have a status level, and it actually every week uh, it kind of uh, essentially will keep you at the level that you've uh, fought hard to get to. It will raise you up a level or it'll drop you a level. All of that is actually a competitive element based on other users. Uh, we have seen when we look at the higher level users, so it's a one to 10. So when we start looking at people in seven, eight, nine, it's a, you know, it's really work for monetization. Those people are uh, determined <laughs> to either maintain or grow their, their position. Uh, so asynchronous type of uh, social experiences, we also see is really uh, important. So we're really looking to, to expand both of those. And, and I think trying to create uh, a social living room, social experiences around voice will just make it that much more natural for people to interact with uh, on a regular basis. Thank you, Paul. And uh, all the things you've mentioned, like from um, the increased number of devices to discovery, monetization, multiplayer dynamics, these are all things that we are actively work on and they are top in investment areas for the assistant team. At the end of the day, like our goal is to enable developers to just build sustainable businesses on our platform. Uh, so stay tuned for more updates on the monetization front and beyond. Ian, um, can you tell us a bit about how Bamboo Learnings envisions the role and impact of voice technology expansion on the educational journey of the future? Can you share with us a preview maybe of your next project on the assistant? Yeah, um, well, let me talk first about uh, Bamboo Luminaries. That's really our first product. Um, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's been honored uh, uh, with awards and, and honors before. Um, and uh, so Bamboo Luminaries has several different features. And, and the basic idea is that we're teaching uh, people about history. And we have over 200 historically important figures uh, with a wide range of different backgrounds. and includes beautiful images uh, that show up uh, really well on, on the Nest Hub. And uh, those different backgrounds might be anything from architecture to uh, film or science and sports. Um, and and uh, really the first feature you would encounter using Bamboo Luminaries is something we call Luminary of the Day. And uh, today, for example, June 25th, the luminary of the day is actually Alexander Hamilton, who, uh, among other things, uh, was the first uh, Secretary of the Treasury of the U.S. Um, and then yesterday, actually, the um, Bamboo Luminary was a woman named Bessie Coleman. She was the first African-American and first Native American woman to be a licensed pilot in the U.S. So you get to learn about a new person every day. And then there's another feature uh, within Bamboo Luminaries called Guess a Luminary. And uh, Guess a Luminary, uh, you know, kind of uh, ties into some of the game dynamics that Paul was talking about. The idea is we give you three clues uh, and you try to guess who the, who the person is. And if you can't guess on the first three clues, we'll offer you a fourth clue. And if it's a, a really difficult one, we'll also offer a fifth one. And each time uh, you play Guess a Luminary, you can earn different points. Obviously, you're going to earn more points uh, if you get, uh, get it on the third, after three clues versus five. Um, but as you earn points, you can move up in the rankings. Uh, and then there's another feature uh, called Explore Luminaries, and that's really where you can select from any of the 200 plus uh, different uh, historically important people, uh, see the beautiful images, learn about them, learn about their life and work. And also, if you want, you can take a quiz. And again, that gives you another opportunity to earn points uh, and move up in the Bamboo Luminaries leaderboard. Uh, so that's really uh, Bamboo Luminaries. Uh, the next one that's coming soon, uh, it's also an award-winning application uh, and it's called Bamboo Math. It should be out in the next few weeks uh, on the Google Assistant. And uh, if you'd like, um, any of the audience out there uh, who wants to participate in a beta can just send us an email at info at bamboolearning.com and we'll put you in the beta program. 
So uh, stay tuned for that. And then uh, additionally, we have three other applications, uh, voice applications on another platform. Those will be coming to Google Assistant. Uh, those are called Bamboo Books, which is really about listening comprehension and reading comprehension, again, with uh, great visuals. And then Bamboo Music, which is an introduction to music theory. And then finally, Highlight Storybooks from Bamboo, which is in partnership with uh, Highlights for Children, the well-known uh, magazine publisher. So we're very excited about uh, bringing all of these to uh, the Google Assistant platform in the coming weeks and months. We are very excited too. Um, and we are really looking forward to seeing all the new experiences live on the Assistant. I played against the luminaries, I'm not gonna lie. I had to use five, five clues um, most of the times um, and I didn't get it even with five clues a few times, uh, but it's really amazing. And I really strongly believe in the value that communal devices can bring to education experiences in the, ho in the home. So I'm really thrilled to see how learning will evolve in the next few years. So I really appreciate both of you taking the time today to join the show. Uh, but before we go, can both of you tell us what is the most popular usage of voice in your, house, in your households lately? Uh, for my wife and I, uh, the assistant feature that we use the most is Remind. Um, I have a little problem. I always forget where I place my keys or wallet around the house. Uh, so I started the habit of telling the assistant where I put things. I can tell you it has been a game changer for me and also for my marriage. Uh, what's popular in your households? So what, what I find, because we have so many devices around the house, is that you know, we're constantly asking the device for a variety of things, uh, information, news. Uh, my son is asking it to solve, help solve math problems. Uh, you know, we can just ask it to play music, uh, to play an audio book. What, what is just amazing is, and the way I like to think about it is we all sort of talk to the walls, uh, but for most of our lives, there, there was never anything, any response or, or any, anything happened. But now you can really just kind of speak out loud and, and ask for, uh, you know, what you want to know and when you want to know it. Um, and, and you get a response. Uh, and that's just been really exciting. Uh, in, in our house, um, well, one of my favorites is pretty much every light in the house uh, I can turn on and off uh, using the Google Assistant. Um, but also my son, who's in his 20s, is really an accomplished chef. And so sometimes he'll come over and, and make dinner for us. And he's got, you know, one saute pan really uh, cooking up pretty hot in one hand and another saute pan in the other hand. And things are getting hot and smoky in the kitchen. So he just says, hey, Google, turn on the kitchen fan and all the smoke clears and we get to have a great meal. Um, also, uh, for me, just listening to a Pandora station or NPR um, using the Google Assistant, that's something I do pretty much every day. All right. So maybe in the next show, uh, your son can, can give a master class on cooking. So maybe that's going to be the topic of the next episode. Um, Ian and Paul, thank you so much for joining here uh, today at Voice Talks. I really enjoyed having you on the show and wish you the best of luck for your future actions on the assistant. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Marco. You. Back to you, Sophia. Thank you, Marco, Ian and Paul. Paul, I loved your perspective of how voice can be the best medium for your TV audience to get to be a contestant themselves. I'm also a big fan of Jeopardy and who wants to be a millionaire and grandma, if you're watching, you know we were definitely those people shouting answers at the TV. And Ian, I have to say I'm with Marco here. I always need more than three clues. But really, one of my favorite things about Bamboo Luminaries is that it connects gaming and education. I was talking to my sister this week and she was telling me that she's constantly trying to turn learning and homework into a game as I honestly think many parents or teachers are doing as well. She's found this to be the best way to keep her kids engaged throughout the entire lesson. So I really love that Bamboo Luminaries is gamifying history. Instead of teaching history straight up, you've kind of created a game of it, motivating the user to think and to guess the luminary before revealing the full description. 
you're also learning with every clue. So I think it's a really clever way to make the game sort of be the lesson itself. And another thing that I wanted to share is that I find it really interesting that when parents are involved in their children's education, the students tend to learn better. With students learning from home, parents are now more involved than ever in their children's education. And we see an opportunity, like Marco was saying, for communal educational experiences that engage both students and parents in a very fun way. So I think that having a voice companion at the center of family learning can really have a compounding effect for many generations to come. So now I want to turn back to my initial question after we just heard from three really cool experiences for the assistant and see what voice experiences you're all using as a family. So let me see some of the comments that you guys submitted. All right, our first coming is from Vishal. And he said that one of his favorite games is Impossible Bollywood Quiz. Vishal, I haven't played this game myself, but I will. But it really sounds impossible. My mom and I are big fans of Bollywood, so we hope that we can guess at least a few of them. And the second comment that we got was from Daniel. And he says, I play song quiz all day, every day. Daniel, song quiz has been on the platform for a long time. And I've also been playing it, but I am really terrible at it. I normally play the 90s songs and I can never guess them correctly. But thank you both so much for submitting your comments. And I'm really happy that you guys are enjoying those games on the Google Assistant. So on the subject of gamification, we announced a new product just like last week at Voice Global, which makes building games even easier. And today you're going to get a special walkthrough on both Action Builder and Canvas. We'll have Nick with our product talk with Leon Nichols breaking down these two products for us. After Leon's talks, we'll go directly into our partner spotlight interview between Mary Chen from Google and Terry Jensen from Cool Games, whose team is building, as the company name indicates, very cool games indeed. Okay, so let's go to Leon to start this off. Thank you so much, Sophia. I'm Leon and I'm a developer relations engineer for the Google Assistant. Today I'll be doing an overview of our latest development tool called Actions Builder. Actions Builder is a web-based IDE that is fully integrated with the Actions console. Only one window needed for all your Actions development. The design of the conversational flow can now be visualized. We've also improved our support for natural language understanding. We provide an inline editor so you can code the webbook fulfillment for your business logic. We support the distribution of your action to early access groups or deploy to production all in one place. Actions Builder processes the user input through intent matching and types. Types are particular data points in the user input. Scenes are used to manage the logic of your conversation so you can construct the appropriate prompts. Static or dynamic prompts can be provided as part of the conversational model. We provide convenient slot filling, which automatically prompts users until all the required data is obtained. We've improved our simulator to provide an execution log with the request and the response data to make it easier to debug your action. We also provide convenient access to the webhook logs. You can test your action on all the supported devices. We've also added a state editor to make it easy to debug a specific scene. Now, scenes is a new concept for action developers, so let's dig into that a little bit. Scenes are logical chunks of your conversation model. They are the executors of an action, doing the heavy lifting and carrying out the logic necessary to drive the conversation forward. You can think of them similar to scenes in a play or a movie. It is a way to modularize the design of your action. Only one scene can be activated at a time, and you can build user journeys with multiple scenes. You can move from one scene to another through transitions, and transitions can be triggered by the scene or an intent. For each scene, the flow starts with on enter, where a prompt can be added to the prompt queue and a webhook call. Then conditions are checked, which are if else statements that could check session, user, or scene parameters following slot filling, which will add a prompt to the next missing slot. And at prompts, the prompt queue is sent to the user via the assistant. Now, when the user responds, the user input is processed, and if it matches a slot, 
the loop starts again by checking the conditions. If the user input matches an intent, then the intent handler is processed and if there isn't a transition, it goes back to the conditions and follows the loop. If there is a transition in the intent handler, it transitions to a different scene. We've also updated our Actions SDK, where developers can build Actions using your preferred tools. The Actions SDK gives you a file-based representation of your Action and the ability to use a local IDE. The best part, it works alongside Actions Builder. This includes all the configuration and resources for your Action, including support for internationalization. The SDK not only enables local authoring of natural language understanding and conversation schemes, but it also allows bulk import and export of training data to improve your conversational model. The Actions SDK is accompanied by a command line interface, so you can build and manage an action fully in code using your favorite source control and continuous integration tools. We also provide client libraries to handle the JSON payloads for the fulfillment requests and responses. Last year we announced Interactive Canvas as a framework to allow game developers to add visual immersive experiences to conversational actions, implemented in HTML, JavaScript or WebAssembly. To allow game developers to create even more engaging experiences, we've announced a new feature called Continuous Match Mode, which we will roll out in the coming months. Continuous Match Mode enables the assistant to instantly recognize developer-defined words and phrases. This mode works with Interactive Canvas. Now during the mode, the microphone stays open for up to a maximum of 180 seconds. Users can exit the mode at any time by saying keywords like cancel or exit. For developers, continuous match mode is an extension of the existing Canvas response. Developers need to provide a new configuration, which consists of a list of expected phrases. The Interactive Canvas web app will receive a callback whenever the user response matches a word in the list. Developers don't have access to the raw user query. The mode ends at the configured time or developers can use an API to explicitly end the mode. Now once the mode ends, the action goes back to the conversational turn taking. Let's take a look at the code. Now continuous match config is part of the Canvas response. It's an array of expected phrases and an optional array of alternate phrases, which are alternates or synonyms. The duration seconds is the duration of the mode session, up to a maximum of 180 seconds. There are two new callbacks provided for the Interactive Canvas web app. On listening mode changed is invoked when the conversational mode switches between turn taking and continuous match mode. On phrase matched is invoked when the user input is matched against one of the configured words or phrases. The matched data is a JSON payload. Here is the matched payload. The phrases are ordered by a decreasing confidence score. The is final value states whether the match is final or not while the assistant is trying to match the user input. We really are excited to see what you build with our latest tools and features. To get started with Actions Builder, Check out our docs and our new code labs. Join us and other Actions developers on Reddit and Twitter. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now, let's chat with Mary Chen from Google Developer Relations and Terry Jansen from Cool Games to see how Cool Games has put Actions Builder into practice. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Mary. I lead strategy for the developer relations team on Google Assistant. I'm excited to talk to Terry today, who's building a couple of games for the Google Assistant. Hey, Terry. Hey, Mary. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining. Tell us a little about yourself and what you do. Okay, uh, my name is Terry. I'm a creative developer at Cool Games. Uh, also, very lucky to be working on two uh, projects for Google Assistant right now. Uh, cool Games is traditionally an HTML5 game developer and publishing uh, publisher. Sorry, in its more recent years, we've shifted more towards AAA games uh, for for uh, big IP holders, uh, games like Angry Birds, uh, Battleship Tetris, Monopoly, and we also have our own line of uh, IPs that is uh, currently online on the different platforms. Yeah, I really need some tips for Angry Birds afterwards. Depending on how the interview goes, we can see about that. 
Cool. So tell us about the new games that you're building on Smart Displays. Okay, we're currently working on uh, two different uh, games on uh, Google Assistant. Uh, the first one is Guess the Drawing, which is uh, a guessing game where a user has to try and use his voice to actually guess a uh, drawing being gradually drawn uh, by actually shouting at the machine and the uh, machine will pick it up really nicely. Uh, the other game we're developing is called uh, Horizontal Crosswords, which is more a traditional puzzle game, um, which can be actually solved using a voice instead of a pen. Nice. They sound fun. Let's talk a little about the details for these games. So the first tool that you're using is a recently launched Actions Builder. How's that development process been like using Actions Builder? So uh, using Action Builder has actually been really fun and easy. Uh, it's, it's mostly like an improved version of Dialogflow. It comes in two different variations. Uh, the version we used is a visual editor which acts as a scene graph uh, with, with, with slots and prompts ready to be filled and um, uh, actually configured any way you like to make an, a conversation really simple to set up and implement. Uh, there's also more developer-oriented version which uses a CLI and can be used on a more uh, programmatic uh, way. It's cool. been fun working with either version. Well, thanks to hear. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, next, you're also using our new interactive Canvas API. And this is something that I feel like a lot of developers are really enjoying. So what are your experiences with that? So the inter interactive canvas is basically uh, a web view, which uh, enables all the power HTML5 has to offer. Uh, since we really uh, uh, ex we have high expertise on working with HTML5, and I think also uh, many game developers out there are already very familiar with this technology. So uh, basically running everything on the interactive canvas was really fun and fluid, really simple to implement. and uh, also flexible on setup. Uh, it uses, uh, for instance, really every popular framework out there. And in our case, we could use our in-game uh, engine quite easily. Yeah, that's great to hear. So the third tool that I want to talk a little about is continuous batch mode. And this is an upcoming feature where the mic will be able to stay open for an extended period of time and users will be able to say multiple words in succession. How is Continuous Match being incorporated in both of your games? So Continuous Match is uh, used in uh, mostly the gameplay sections of, uh, of our games. So for uh, I guess a drawing, it is done well. Uh, a, a drawing is being revealed. The, the user actually has to, has to shout at the machine and try and, and guess the, what he sees as the correct answer. On top of that, we added uh, a multiplayer mode, which can be used locally with uh, up to six people, uh, where every person has to select a color beforehand and, uh, and play basically a party game. Um, so that's just the drawing mostly. For horizontal crossword, uh, it's, it's more like traditional uh, puzzle solving, like I said earlier, where a user has to solve a crossword, use the letters as bonuses, and also use his voice to navigate through the, the, the game basically. Cool. I love these types of games. So excited for when they're coming out. So the final question I have for you is uh, you're a seasoned game developer in the space. Love to hear your thoughts on building these types of voice first games. And what do you see the future of gaming to look like with such technologies? It's actually an excellent question. Uh, for us internally, this is the first time working with a voice controlled game. Uh, with all things new, of course, there's new challenges that have to be overcome, uh, both on conceptual and technical levels, uh, which some, some issues were really uh, mostly on getting your head around uh, how, how interaction changes compared to uh, more normal uh, user interaction. Uh, but at the same time, when you actually do manage to get, uh, to get the flow going correctly, uh, it feels really natural using your voice to navigate and play through games. Um, so it's been a really fun experience mostly. Uh, on top of that, uh, we do see voice controlled uh, usage uh, used to on, on very many different applications and games already out there as well. So we expect it to be more and more 
widely used. Uh, on top of that, I would really recommend any developer at least mildly interested in working with uh, force controlled gaming to uh, give the Google Assistant a try because it was uh, really fun, simple and to set up and work with at least. And I guess we had our first uh, playable prototype in under an hour. So definitely go wow. ahead. That's awesome. When can we expect these games to be ready? Uh, the first one is coming uh, beginning of July. So that would be around next week, maybe week after. And the second one will uh, be end of July. So cool. hope you like them. Yeah. Well, Terry, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts on building these smart display games for the Google Assistant. Thanks for having us, Mary. Yeah. Well, back to you, Sophia. Thank you so much, Leon, Mary, and Terry, for giving us such a comprehensive dive into Action Builder and Canvas and how it's being used in those two games. If you have any questions for Leon, he's responding in the chat or by using the hashtag AskSofia on Twitter throughout the show. And as Terry mentioned, Guess the Drawing and Horizontal Crossword Game will be launching very soon, but I wanted to give you a preview since I've been loving playing this game, so take a look. Circles and ovals. Instrument. Trumpet. Metal disc. And give me a hint. Give me another hint. Oh, toilet paper. Yay! You can see I'm not so great at it yet, but I do intend to get much better. And you know that we love to spotlight interesting projects like this from our community in every episode. So please continue to get in touch with us and let us know what you or your company are working on. And before we move on to our last guest, I love to share this video from a 16-year-old developer, Isha, about a learning action she created. Take a look. Hello everyone, my name is Isha Basin and I am from India. I am a 16-year-old voice enthusiast who loves building Google Actions through Google Assistant. The most interesting action that I have ever built is InstaFacts, which tells you about various facts ranging from plants, animals, body, space, and various other facts which will make your mind go wow. Thank you, Isha. I love that you created InstaFax Action at 16 years old. I used it and learned the origin of the word goodbye and new ways to potentially get rid of hiccups that I honestly didn't know before. I've been always using the old scaring tactic that, to be honest, doesn't work that well, at least for me but we'll be sending you a Google Assistant device so that you can continue using Instafax and other actions around your home and so that you can continue building great voice experiences. Next, I'm incredibly excited to introduce you to Katherine Prescott from VoiceBrew, who many of you might already know as she's talking to an avid community of users every day. Here's Katherine. Thank you so much, Sophia. I am so excited to be here today and thank you for having me. So I wanna start out today by talking a little bit about why I love voice. I think voice is just a better way to do so many things. And I think a lot of people watching probably agree. You know, a lot of people have gotten used to over the past couple of decades, tapping and typing but really talking is the most natural way that we communicate. And it's also the fastest way that we communicate. So no one's gonna be surprised looking at this slide. We can type 38 words per minute. We can talk 135 words per minute, but I still just think it shows how much more effective and efficient voice is as an input. But it's not just that it's more efficient. There's also just so much that you can do with your voice. It's useful in so many ways. And it's also really fun. And this is all of these reasons are why I started Voice Brew a year and a half ago. And Voice Brew's mission is to really help people get more out of their voice assistance. I really want to help people use voice to make their lives even better. 
And today we are 50,000 subscribers. We send a daily email newsletter. It's free with an awesome, fun tip. And I really hope that you will join our community. So when I first talk to people about voice brew, I often get the same question. They ask me, Catherine, how do you find something to write every single day when you focus on such a narrow type of content, writing about consumer use cases for voice? And I always give the same answer. I listen to subscribers. I get dozens of subscriber emails every single week and I respond and I engage with all of them. So whether it's somebody reaching out to me with an issue that they need help solving, they can't get something to work, they're trying to use some new feature and it's just not, it's just not going well for them. I will go back and forth with them until we figure it out. People reach out to me all the time with feature requests and I probe to understand what's the problem that they're really trying to solve with this. And I also love getting emails from people with messages about what they're really enjoying. What are the new things that they're starting to do with their voice assistants? And I always propose something else for them to try that's related to see how they react. And all of these things together, you might be thinking, that sounds pretty time consuming. And it is, but this is so important. It's important for Voice Brew to build an engaged and strong community but building a strong community, building strong relationships with your subscribers, your customers, your clients, it's important for any business. But for Voice Brew, in addition to this, this is really how we keep our content fresh and useful to subscribers by listening. So from all of these conversations and email exchanges come two broad types of content that Voice Brew covers. And the first type of content is this is the stuff that users are asking for. This is what they want to hear about. And then on the other hand, and maybe where Voice Brew adds the most value, is use cases for voice that we think that they should be trying and doing, but that they would never know to ask for. So there's both a pull on the one hand and a push. So let's start with the first type of content some of the top requested features recently from Voice Brew subscribers. And looking at this slide, you might be surprised. So let's start with the left-hand side of the slide. Severe weather alerts. Yes, this is a narrow use case. And you might be thinking, you know, this is only gonna be useful a handful of times a year. Lots of places in the world don't even have really severe weather. So is this even relevant? But if you live in South Florida, which is a very active hurricane zone in the summer, this is going to give you an added sense of comfort every single day to know that you have another line of defense to alert you when bad weather is coming your way. So let's shift over to the right side of this slide. And this is shopping list categories. People have been emailing me for over a year asking me if they can add categories to their shopping lists. And the reason that they want to do this is that when you're grocery shopping, when you're in a certain aisle, you want to know all the things that you need in that aisle. And having a well-organized shopping list helps you do that. So these use cases are basic and narrow, but they really do affect people's everyday lives. So now I want to switch gears to the second type of broad content type that Voice Brew covers, and that's introducing features that users don't know about. And a lot of these things, might, users might not even think that they would be possible. So we in the voice industry talk about discovery all the time, and there are so many different viewpoints on this. And what I have found is that voice continues to be a new technology for a lot of users, most users, but that the really good news is that they are just dying to do more with their voice assistants. They want to learn to do more um, with voice. And I think that is something that's been really surprising, not surprising, something that's been really exciting for me. 
So I want to highlight a few great voice experiences that I absolutely love that I have been sharing with users. So let's start with games. Conceptually, of course, almost all voice users know that they can play games with their smart assistants, but what they don't know is which games to try, which ones are fun, how do you start playing? If you start and you need to break, take a break, can you come back? And these are all things that I am helping to educate subscribers to Voice Brew about. So this slide shows a few of my favorite games. I love Escape the Room. Song Quiz is a classic and Akinator is a lot of fun. It's one I've been playing a ton more recently. Highly recommend giving it a try. Just say, hey Google, play Akinator. Um, you will be surprised and impressed. So educational voice experiences. It's the exact same thing as games. Users are looking to be prompted. So here I share a few of my favorite educational voice experiences and starting with Bamboo Luminaries on the left. I loved hearing from Ian Freed, who's the CEO of and founder of Bamboo Learning earlier in the segment. I'm a big fan of Bamboo Luminaries and I highly recommend after this episode, going up to your smart speaker and saying, open Bamboo Luminaries so you can check it out for yourself. I also love question of the day from Matchbox and This Day in History is something I've been playing around with more recently in the morning. It's kind of just a nice one to start the day to get a historic fact. Something else I want to talk about when it comes to voice and education is just that you can ask your voice assistant any question and you will probably be pleasantly surprised that your voice assistant will give you the answer that you're looking for. So whether you want to know about how, whether, how and whether you can recycle a certain type of plastic bottle, or you want to know how to say happy birthday in Italian, ask your voice assistant. And on this point too, yes, you could pull out your phone and search for it on your phone. But what's so great about doing it on your voice assistant instead is that you stay in the moment with the people that you're with. And that's really nice. So I want to touch for a minute on smart home. I think, and a lot of people agree with me, that smart home is one of the killer use cases for voice. Um, basic smart home stuff like smart lights and smart plugs has proliferated really quickly over the past few years. And even the really down the middle users of voice have smart home devices set up. And so what I'm trying to do more recently kind of move people beyond these basic use cases for smart home into things that are maybe more interesting or surprising to them. So something that we covered recently in Voice Brew was using your voice assistant to start up your car before you, a few minutes before you leave the house. And that's really nice because it means that on a really hot summer day, you don't have to get into a really hot car. Your car can be nice and cool when you get in. And here are just a handful of the automakers that have voice experiences um, so that you can do this. And there are dozens more that you, can, that, uh, that you can look for. So if you are curious to find out whether your car, whether you can start up your car with your voice assistant, search for its automaker in the Google Assistant Actions Directory or the Alexa Skill Store to find out. And to me, what, what, I just, what, what I just talked about um, with starting up your car, this is such a great example of something that is actually very simple to set up, but that is just so impactful and just so magical for your kind of average voice user. So over the last few minutes, I have shared some of my favorite use cases for voice. But I want to hear from you with your favorite use cases for voice. So tweet at me. I am at KB Prescott and use the hashtag AskSophia and send me your favorite, really useful, surprising, um, super helpful, unusual use cases for voice. 
I can't wait to keep, learn about them. I can't wait to try them. And I can't wait to cover them in future voice brews. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, this was really a lot of fun. Catherine, thank you so much. Voice brew is such a key component to the voice ecosystem because it answers the burning questions of how to make the most of our devices. And I can relate so much to what you discuss. If you've been watching Voice Talks, you can probably tell that I can 100% without a doubt talk faster than 135 words per minute. And I'm not necessarily proud of it, but I swear that when I'm passionate about something as I am about voice, I can speak way too fast as I'm probably doing right now. But Catherine, I also really enjoyed the games you mentioned. I've always actually found Akinator to be so impressive. Akinator has been on the platform for a few years now, and for those of you who don't know it, you basically have to think of a character, and you don't say it out loud. Then the game asks you a few questions, sort of like, is your character real or not real? Is it a character from Disney? And then through those series of questions, it always guesses your character correctly. I can be super competitive, so I always think of really hard characters and it still always guesses them right. It really surprises me every time that I play it. And Catherine also mentioned that you can ask to these devices things like how to say happy birthday in Italian. And that is so true. Similar to this, we also receive a comment from Gaffer in India and it says, I try to encourage my students to use Google Assistant to improve their pronunciation as well as voice recognition technology. Thanks, Gaffer. This is a really great point, and it's something that we didn't talk much about today, but I actually use voice for learning new words and from pronunciation all of the time. A funny story about this is that for the first episode of Voice Talks, I kept saying that we are going to debut or we're going to be debuting Voice Talks. I honestly don't even know how I was saying it anymore, but it wasn't correct because everyone was like, Sophia, what are you saying? And I'm like, debuting. But then I quickly learned that it's debuting, such a complicated word, but before the episode, I kept asking the assistants for help on how to pronounce it so that I could practice it with it. And like this, I use it in this manner very often. There's also many language-based voice experiences available in virtual assistants that can teach you almost any language from Spanish, French, German, Korean, Chinese, Bahasa, you name it. It can really help you fine tune your pronunciation by enabling users to listen and speak to their devices rather than having to read and guess how to pronounce a certain word. So Gaffer, thank you so much for your comment. I love to hear that I'm not alone and we'll be sending you a Voice Sucks t-shirt like this one. I'm practically living in them. So I think and I hope that you will enjoy it as well. And for our last video of the day, I wanna show you a wonderful example from Roddy McNeil who submitted this video about how he's using voice to make a classic game accessible for all. Using Google's voice technology, I recreated the classic Adventure A Planet of Death to make the traditional text adventure game available to a whole bunch of people who may have been unable to play it before due to difficulties with their eyesight or physical differences. It allows the genre to be introduced to a whole new audience who may have never played this kind of game before with a much expanded vocabulary, enhanced locations and puzzle solving in an atmospheric environment. Thank you, Roddy. We'll be sending you a Google Assistant and we hope that you continue to make games accessible to a wider community. This is a perfect way to end today's episode and to give you a little hint of what's coming for episode four. In our next episode, we will cover potentially one of my favorite things about working in voice, highlighting the efforts the voice community is taking to ensure voice is inclusive for all. So we would love to hear, what is one way you can make voice inclusive and accessible for all? Let us know in the comments or by using the hashtag AskSophia on Twitter, and we would love to include some of these examples in our future episode. That is it for this month. Thank you so much to our incredible guests, Marco, Paul, Ian, Terry, Mary, Leon, Catherine, and Brad. Thank you so much for making our lives funner and making us smarter through your cool experiences. And as always, thank you to the crew behind the scenes and to you for taking the time every month to come and hang out with us at Voice Talks and share with the community your ideas and thoughts. Next month's Voice Talks will be streaming live on July 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. 
Thanks again to everyone for watching and see you soon in July. Ciao! Thank you.